And hello and welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysick. My partner, Malik Hill. January 12th, 2022. And college football is all over. We have a champion. We do, and it is not yeah. Alabama. Somebody's at the top of the mountain, and it's not good old Nick. I'm so glad. Um, so, yeah, Georgia won the national championship over Alabama, 33-18. to 18, And it was a doozy. Uh, for a while, it looked like, honestly, there wasn't going to be a whole lot of scoring or yeah, anything. It, was, it started pretty slow. It was a lot of defense. A lot of like them just feeling themselves out. Yeah, there was... Uh, yeah. Five field goals in the first half, and uh, the first touchdown didn't come until the end of the third quarter, where Georgia ran it in for a yard um, touchdown, and then it just got crazy in the fourth quarter. Um, I mean, so in the fourth, Alabama kicked another field goal, then they got their first touchdown pass. They went up eighteen to thirteen, and I, a lot of my friends were saying it was over at that point. They thought it was no way Georgia could could like bounce back and make a big play, yeah. Because it was Alabama, pretty much. And they would be wrong because, I mean, I, I don't even know what happened. Like Georgia, just all of a sudden, everything just started going right. It felt like uh, Stetson Bennett got um, a couple of touchdown passes at the end, uh, put them up twenty six to eighteen. And then on the final drive, Alabama's trying to, you know, make some miraculous drive to get into the end. <laughs> and Georgia picks off Bryce Young for a 79-yard interception return for a touchdown. And it sealed the game away. And like we said, Georgia is now the national champion. Unfortunately, it stays within the SEC. But it's not Alabama. And I'm happy about that. Um, and it makes... I think it makes the whole college football playoff more exciting that it's not Alabama. Uh, because before this, Alabama had won seven of the 13 last national yeah, championships. Half, half of the last, yeah, 12 or 13. Uh, and that just, <laughs> just rubs me the wrong way. Oh, my gosh, my camera fell. Bear with me. We're going to keep going, but I'll fix it. I think I got it. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, did you think the game was boring at all? Like, I, I've heard some people say it. Obviously, the fourth quarter changed everything. But did you find, like, the majority of the game boring because of the way that it was played defensively? Or did you enjoy that it was good defense being played? Well, from the jump, I thought it was interesting that both teams were, were struggling to score on the other. And a really good defensive game I don't think is very boring. But – at some point, there was there was a moment where it was nine to six, and it seemed like it was just going to be a game of field goals. And then Bryce Young hits Jamison Williams on a big pass. Jamison Williams plants to cut, and he tears his ACL. Yeah. At that point, it seemed like it was going to be one of those slow down games. They they gave Brian Robinson a lot of touches. Mm -hmm. Their running back, he had twenty two for sixty eight yards, so it didn't work out as great as they hoped. He had a few catches. He had to run through like three or four people every time he got the ball yeah. to get positive yards. So Georgia really dug their heels in, unlike they, like the way they couldn't in the SEC championship. Right. And it really, it it's like it's not good to say, but it helped them. It technically helped them that Jamison Williams was out because after that they had to play mostly freshman receivers, and you could tell even though they had a bunch of talent, they weren't ready. Yeah. A few of them were able to make a few nice plays, but they couldn't make the plays that a guy like Jamison Williams and J John Mechie, who's been out for like the past four or five games, their top number two receiver. They had to rely a lot on Slade Bolden. Um, uh, what's the name of their tight end? Cameron Latu. Yeah, Cameron Latu. He had a pretty good game. I think he had five catches for like 100 and a touchdown. But, yeah, for the rest of the game, they couldn't get a ton of, of consistency on offense. Yeah. Now, Georgia wasn't able to either because Alabama's defense just sent pressure nonstop. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was really weird that people were going so hard on Stetson Bennett for, for a good chunk of the game. Honestly, until he hit that big play in the fourth quarter that put them ahead. He was running around a lot. He was trying to escape pressure. 
He couldn't make plays when he needed to. And I don't know. It's like they, they wanted him to get benched, and they wanted JT Daniels to come in the game. But what would he have done against that pressure? Yeah, He can't move around as well as uh, Stetson Bennett can. So it might have been even uglier. I don't know what they thought. I, I don't think that – what what was going to be the quick fix? Yeah, People just seem to think something would have changed for some reason. Yeah, and the big thing is, like, he didn't turn the ball over. Exactly. He, he almost fumbled on the first drive. They had a messy first drive. But, yeah, yeah after that, he did the best he could for most of the game. Right. Bryce Young threw two picks. Granted, one was at the end of the game. And you're yeah. trying to make some big play, you know. Um, but, like, other than that, like, Bryce Young had 369 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. So, I think Stetson did his job. He he did what he needed to do, and then you can rely on the the defense after that. Like that's that's how Georgia's played all year long. So yeah, hit big plays when you need to. Yeah, and yeah, rely on the defense. Yep. And it's it's pretty wild that we're at this point in college football where offense is the reason why most teams win championships, and this defense being close to all time great is the reason why they won. After, like, the Jacob Coker National Championship Alabama won over Clemson in 2015, most people assumed you could never win another championship with a quarterback that's not high level. Yeah. And Stetson Bennett just proved throughout the year that he was steady, he was reliable, he didn't make many mistakes, he could get out and run whenever there was pressure. He just made plays whenever they needed him to. And this is a guy that was a walk-on at Georgia, left to go to junior college, put up big numbers there, came back to Georgia, got on scholarship, and has kind of lucked into being a starter for multiple years. Last year, JT Daniels ended up taking over because Stetson Bennett got hurt. But come back this year, JT Daniels gets hurt again. Stetson Bennett takes over, becomes the leader of the team, and wins them a national championship. Yeah. It's a really cool story. Yep. And good for Kirby because if he lost this one, he would yeah. have been like 0-5 or 0-6 against Bama, and Georgia fans would have tore him apart. Yep. Especially this was the year they had to get Bama. With Jamison Williams out and Alabama being as young as they were, this was the year they had to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great run by Georgia. Um, they were kind of the season-long favorite, and then they sort of kind of stumbled just because of the Alabama loss. So people got nervous. So it's cool that they kind of finished the season strong. Did what they needed to do, and uh, are now the national champions. Yeah, it it makes me feel a little bit better about the Michigan loss. Yeah, because they were the eventual eventual champions, and they were clearly the best team in the country. They just happened to slip up once against Alabama. Right. Yeah. Um. So yeah, what what were your thoughts about the whole college football season this year? Now that now that you have had time to decompress after the Michigan loss and things like yeah. that. I just not just because this Michigan season is the best one I've witnessed as a Michigan football fan, but this is one of the best seasons in a long time. There were a, a bunch of up and downs. There were teams that came out of nowhere. You had the UTSA story, a few other miracle teams. You had Bailey Zappi at Western uh, Kentucky breaking the a bunch of all time passing records, yards, touchdowns. He passed Joe Burrow's <laughs> uh, touchdown record just. Exactly. A couple years later. Yeah, you you had new coaches, you had new players in places. It was just Clemson having a down year out of nowhere. Just it, it was unexpected at every turn. Every few weeks there were great games and things you didn't expect happening. Mm-hmm. I mean, starting with the Oklahoma-Texas game, the Red River rivalry in week three, I think it was, that game was just absolutely bananas and just fireworks all over the place. And it seems like ever since then, there were high-level games every week. Yeah. And, yeah, it was it was a great college football season. Yeah, it makes it exciting uh, heading into next season again because Michigan and Michigan State should be pretty much the same. I mean, Michigan State, obviously, they're going to have to figure out a way to replace Kenneth Walker. Um, and Michigan's going to have to find some, some defensive replacements, but we know that their recruiting should be good. Uh, so we'll see on that end, but I'm excited for both teams to be solid again. Yeah, they're they're already a, a bunch of way too early preseason rankings. Yeah, and I think it was only one I saw. There was one analyst that went out on a big limb and had Michigan State seven preseason and Michigan thirteen. Wow. Every other analyst had Michigan top ten. 
Yeah. But they flipped it and just assumed Mel Tucker is just going to get them to that level immediately. Mm-hmm. Very yeah. interesting stuff. Yep. And also, we get to get into draft talk now, so that's always an exciting time of year. Yeah. Yeah, it it is. So now we'll be able to do some off-season stuff as the NFL season starts to wrap up and college football players are entering the draft and things like that. So, yeah, that's an exciting time to start speculating on. Um, but, yeah, college football was fun this season. And now we're into NFL playoffs and college basketball, NBA. So it's kind of basketball season almost. Um, so we're going to talk about that next. We got the NCAA kind of are now into their conference games. So things are starting to heat up a little bit. It's starting to get a little more exciting. And I think the most exciting thing for me right now is that there is nobody that's undefeated anymore. Yeah. Just in the past week, I think it was – was it two teams that were undefeated? Yeah. Yeah. USC, like in the past five days, two teams. Yeah, so Yesterday, two teams lost their undefeated. Yeah. yeah. So USC and Baylor, Baylor being the number one in the country, USC was up to number five. Both these teams were undefeated. The only ones left – after Gonzaga and Duke were the early season favorites, they've lost a couple games. Baylor lost to Texas Tech, and USC lost to Stanford. And I just think that that it goes back to what we keep saying about college basketball every year is like it seems to be more competitive year in and year out, and you don't know who's going to be the favorite coming into it. And just a couple weeks ago, Duke lost to Miami, yeah. so Duke lost their second game of the season. Um, it's just so hard to predict. We thought Purdue was going to run away with the Big Ten. They've lost two games. They the lost season. against Wisconsin, who has one of the top up-and-coming players in the country in Johnny Davis. Yeah. He's just been destroying people. Right. So, again, the Big Ten becomes another one of those nightmare conferences that you have to face. And I think the interesting thing is there's now, like, at the beginning of the season, and it's still somewhat the same, like, Chet Holmgren and Paolo Banchero – are going to be top prospects. But there's been some other guys that have jumped into the mix. Yeah. We've seen Auburn uh, with Jabari Smith, and, like, he could be the number one guy now. Like, I don't know. What What do you think about some of the prospects out of this class? Like, what what do you think this class is starting to shape up into? Because we're going we're gonna to transition this into the NBA because the Pistons are, are at the bottom, and we'll be looking at these players. Yeah, so I, at this point, there's a clear one, two, and three. Jabari, a lot of people have Jabari Smith ranked at one now because he's just been lights out for Auburn, and they're close to being the top team in the country. Yeah. Then, like you said, you got Chet and Paolo, who both haven't disappointed at all. I mean, like everybody knows the one thing with Chet is his weight, Mm -hmm. and he still could be projected to number one because three, four years down the road, if he's up to 230, he could be completely unstoppable. Yeah. But, yeah, those three guys – I'm really excited to see what they do for the rest of the season and how they transition into draft talks and the summer because this might be one of the most loaded lotteries we've ever, we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think picks one through five, there could be high level all star to superstar players at every pick, and then once you go past five, you could go up to like eleven or twelve, and there are still a bunch of players that can help teams right now. So it's it's a deep crop of talent. It's really exciting. You got more experienced guys like Jaden Ivey from Purdue who going into the season, I didn't see why everybody was hyping him up to be like a player of the year candidate. And he's just improved in every facet. Like he hits deep threes like it's nothing. Now his his jumper still looks kind of weird, but he hits threes at a high rate. He's super athletic. He's gotten stronger and he's a good defender. So he's up there. Like I said, Johnny Davis is the biggest razor from Wisconsin. He's a two-guard that last year was pretty good, but it's taken a huge leap that nobody expected. I think he's averaging like Mm 22-7-3. Every team he goes against, he's just shredding. And then you have some G League guys like Jaden Hardy, who I've been high on for a few years now because I've known about him for since he was 16 or 17. I saw him play in a high school showcase on ESPN. And to me, he is like a young Gilbert Arenas. Mm-hmm. he's aggressive on offense and he has almost no flaws in his game. He can hit jumpers from deep. He's athletic. He has handle. He has, um, he doesn't have a complete game obviously cause he's so young, but he has so much to build off of already. 
that he can come into the league and average like 18, 19 on a bad team. So, yeah, it, going up to, like, the top five and even past that, there are so many guys. It's a deep draft. Yeah. And there aren't many places where I think teams can go wrong right. because there's so much talent. Yeah. And I and I will say well, – I'll backtrack just for a second because we're going to transition to the NBA just right about now. The reason we're not talking about Michigan or Michigan State is because Michigan got scared and they postponed their game. Ha, 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 ha. That's, that's why. Uh, that's so, the exact reason why. COVID hit Michigan – uh, they had to postpone the Michigan Michigan State game and the Michigan Purdue game, uh, so we're gonna have to wait even longer to figure out what Michigan's gonna look like. Unfortunately, um, so yeah, that's kind of why we skipped over that. So Michigan State didn't have a game, um, and yeah, so we'll get back to them next week, hopefully. Um, but transitioning to the NBA, and you brought up those guys, and now there's very a very particular reason why I think. I mean, I, I guess this is just to humor me, but like. Now the Pistons should draft Chet. And you know why. They just made a big splash. Well, sort of big splash. They made it onto Woj, uh, a Woj bomb. The Pistons traded Rodney Magruder and a future second-round pick for our guy, Bull Bull. It's time to start buying the jerseys. It's time to start getting whatever merch you can. This was a guy projected in the top five of his draft class at the time. Um, before he got injured, and he only played, what, I think eight or nine games in college for Oregon. And so he got hurt, and he fell pretty far. I think but he got drafted by the Heat, and that draft rights were traded yeah. to the Nuggets. On he fell night. farther than anybody expected to the second round. Yeah, so we thought that, that was going to be a huge boon for the Nuggets to have him. They just never found him a spot in the rotation for some reason. It he, seems like they drafted him, and like they had no plan. And yeah. they never implemented one. Yeah, and so now uh, he kind of was wasting a roster spot for them because they are a, a contender, um, and he's still a little bit raw. He's shown some flashes. He's had some some solid games. He's he's had some solid looks, uh, but I mean his season average is like two minutes a game and like two points or something like that. So for him to come to the Pistons, I am really hoping that Dwayne Casey just tries to let him develop as much as we can. We're playing Trey Lyles right now uh, in meaningful minutes. So. And it's hilarious that he's, like, playing well and shooting well. Yeah. Mostly because he's on the Pistons, but it's he's playing pretty well. Right. So, I mean, the majority of it is because Kelly Olenek is still out and yeah. things like that. But we need big – like, we have no bigs. Trey Lyles is a 6'10 big. Luka Garza is a 6'10. Like, we just don't have that one big guy. Even Isaiah Stewart, he's like a 6'9 center. Like He might be like 6'7. Yeah, yeah, he's – He's kind of like Ben Wallace, where he's undersized, um, but you know he's he's strong. So we don't have, but we don't have pure size, and that's what we've been saying. So to add Bull Bull to this team, although it might be to the detriment of Luca Garza, I hope it's Trey Lyles actually. But I, you can bring in Bull Bull and Luca Garza at the same time. Yeah, you can. Honestly, I'm just saying like there's only so many yeah. roster spots. I don't know what they're gonna do. Well, we we know Trey. The veterans on this team won't be around for long. Right. So he's not a focus. Corey Joseph isn't a focus. Those guys are here temporarily. Yeah. And so I just hope that they give him all the minutes. Like they I need. Agree. I know you don't you don't want to start with giving him thirty minutes, but at least give him like twenty minutes a night for a while. See what this guy can do because he could be such an asset. And then, then like I said, if you go into next year's draft and you draft Chet Holmgren, those guys can both play four and five and can handle the ball. And that just that's so fun to me. Yeah. I, I know it's kind of – It's a it's a weird era of basketball. It's kind of so a many... gimmicky thing, but, like, to have two guys that are over seven I foot – I mean, in this era, it's not very gimmicky because you have so many guys that are yeah. 6'10 or bigger that can handle the ball. Right. And you just hope that they can put on just a little bit of weight. They don't need to put on a lot. I, I, I think he's – I don't think he's going to put on I, a ton. I don't either, but I'm just saying I think just a little. Like, you know, when you get into that NBA training regime, hopefully they would. Um, but I, it's just – it's another great move for this front office, I feel like. Yeah, getting Bowl Bowl for a bag of chips, basically. Exactly. Is Magruder really good. Was, and Magruder was fine. He's a nice veteran piece. He doesn't work on this team. Yeah. We don't need him for anything. Exactly. Uh, Bol Bol, there's a weird thing with him where they were the you put they, there are certain YouTube, I mean Twitter accounts that will post highlights of him whenever he get playing time, 
and he would have four to five minute like stints of looking like an absolute phenom. Yeah. But he never got played more than like eight or nine minutes a game. So you got those short stints and it's like, wow, look at what this kid can do. And then he would just be gone for the rest of the game. Right. My thing is, can that actually be stretched out? Right. Is he a guy that you only need to play like 10, 11, 12 minutes a game? He'll give you he'll give you six to seven minutes of holy crap. Like, look at this level of talent. Mm-hmm. And that's enough. Because we we both this this is more than like Thon Maker. Yeah. Well, they traded for him, and at that point it was it was clear that he had a little bit of talent, but he was never going to reach yeah. what people I, thought. I think the the difference, too, is that like it still was later in Thon's career when yeah. the Pistons got him. Exactly. Bol Bol's still – like, Bol Bol's been in the league a couple of years now. You don't – some people don't really realize that already, but, like, he's still only 22. Yeah, he hasn't been used much. In Milwaukee, they tried to use Thon a ton. Yeah. They started him in a lot of games, so. Right. Yeah, so – yeah, I, I think it's it's a low risk, high reward play because if you can get Bull Bull, if he plays to what we think he can be, you got Cade Cunningham, Sadiq Bay, Bull Bull. I mean, I guess Isaiah Stewart, but until the draft, like Isaiah Stewart might be moved to the bench if Bull Bull starts to play well at least. Yeah, like and moving into yeah. next year. I'm not there, talking about this year. Yeah. Plus, there's possibility of trading Jeremy Grant. By the trade deadline, that, that also, a bunch of, of playoff teams are going to want him. I was going to say that also makes me more excited to trade Jeremy now because yeah. we have another new young guy that we can play in place of him while we try to figure out a deal uh, for Jeremy Grant because now it's starting to look like, again, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but we might need a new point guard. <laughs> yeah, I was – well, Cade might be the point guard of the future un- right. unless they yeah. find a veteran eventually. Yeah. But – yeah, I, I had a talk with my friend about the Pistons earlier today, and he was telling me, like, trading Jeremy Grant to the Bulls for, like, Patrick Williams. I've heard some would, of that talk, That would too. be a really nice trade, and it it would help out the Pistons a ton. It would help out the Bulls a ton, and it would put the Pistons – they would still be on the right track. Yeah. And I also – when it comes to Bull Bull, it's good to know. He's he's low-risk, high-reward, but we've, we've said this about guys like Sekou and, like, Killian – and I'm sure we said it about Thon Maker when he came to Detroit. We know there's a level of talent with Bobo that those those other guys didn't have. Mm-hmm. So you let him play, he's going to show you some things that those other guys didn't and still haven't. Yeah. So I, yeah, I really like the move. There's possibilities for a bunch of other moves to be made. And I think it's almost guaranteed they're going to get a top four pick. Right. And wherever they land between one and four, I'm – I'm honestly, of course you want the one or two, but if they get three or four, they're still a high-level player that could be right there right? because the lottery is so deep. Yeah, and again, because of the style of play these days is that no matter who you get, like all the top guys right now are big guys for the most part. And so that's basically what I think the Pistons are going to need. And any of those guys would be able to pair well with a guy like Bull Bull. A, they all have guard skills. Or all, even, all of the top bigs in this draft. Even Isaiah Stewart. Like, if Bull Bull doesn't work out and we have to stick with Isaiah Stewart as the center, those guys fit in as a combo 4-5 that yeah. can stretch the floor or something like that and do things that Stewart can't do. Um, so, yeah, it, it it just makes things really exciting, I think, for this Pistons team because they're obviously, like you said, they're, they're going to get one of those top picks. You don't know where it's going to land exactly, but – I mean, they're the bottom of the barrel. They've had – they just got blown out by the Bulls last night, but they had a really good win against the Jazz the, yeah. uh, a couple nights before. So they're still one of the they, – they, the team that we saw last year where they compete in a lot of games, but sometimes they just get – They they get blown out more now because yeah. they're so young and they are they might be the least talented team in the league overall. And they have a bunch of pieces that on, that might not fit. They're still figuring out a ton. So even though wins might don't matter that much this season, getting that win against Utah meant something. Seeing how Cade took over the game and how Sadiq was on fire yeah. and how they came back from 26 against a high-level playoff team, there's a lot of promise. Yeah, And there, there are signs that Cade and Sadiq are the guys you stick with and are the future for the next, like, eight, nine, ten years. Yeah. And I know it's because of COVID protocols and stuff, but it's kind of funny that, like, all of a sudden, the Pistons have guys that I've kind of always wanted. Um, I like that they're playing Saban Lee more. Yeah. They 
ended up adding Cassius Stanley, which I, I was a favor of in the draft. Big I know Cassius guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just like his plays. He's exciting to watch. Um, we've gotten to see Hamadou Diallo play again. and He's shown some real signs. I was going to say, we of, talked about it, yeah. I think, last week or maybe a couple weeks ago that he had some really big games. Now he's he's gone back to more of a role in this offense. He's not as much the focal point that he was when everybody was out. Yeah. But he's still giving us quality minutes, very good efficiency, and he's kind of just filling up the stat sheet all over the place, which is exactly what you want to see. Like, the Pistons are just – compiling all these young guys or guys that are still young that have been in the league for a couple of years now and they're figuring out roles for them. And even like Josh Jackson is still getting good minutes and he's playing pretty solid with them here and there. So I, I again, I compare it to the lions where you know, they're going to lose, but there is actually some excitement and some bright spots that you can see for this team. Exactly. And it, it at least gives us a little bit of hope moving forward. Like, I, if you compare, it's it's not a great comparison, but, like, team to team, Amonra St. Brown is kind of like the Cade of the Lions situation. You pick him, he has potential, and he's already reaching that potential. He could be a high-level number two receiver. Number one, who knows, I assume number two, and a guy like Tyler Boyd, who's just a really good, consistent slot receiver in number two. Right. Amonra St. Brown could be that guy. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I mean. And Penae Sewell, too. Right. There's guys that you can build off of and even guys like Sadiq Bay that you didn't ex- I think Sadiq Bay is more like a on there St. Brown where it's like yeah that you, that is a you, better yeah you a know glue piece. you know there's talent there but is it going to transition into the pro level and I think for both it has yeah. like Sadiq Bay we we're kind of like oh yeah I forgot about that guy going into the draft and then they draft him and now he's he's one of I think like a fan favorite for a lot yeah. of people you know what you're going to get out of both of them for the most of their careers probably yeah that's very exciting. Um, what else in the NBA? Oh, yeah. Uh, Clay Thompson returned for the Warriors. That's uh, Great that times. pretty big news. Just as uh, Golden State was, uh, they're not like struggling, but they were kind of slumping slightly. I think they're six, yeah. Yeah, they're six and four in their last 10, so they're down, I, I guess. How much of it did you see of Clay? Highlights uh, or? Yeah, yeah, just mostly highlights and things like that. So I watched the game, and it was. I was shocked about how good good he l- was moving and how good he looked. Even though it's clear he's rusty. Yeah. He's been out for almost more than two years. But first basket, he gets it coming off a screen, drives into the lane, hits a floater. And then that, that crossover and the dunk in the lane. Yeah. He showed he's he's not afraid at all. He is so like he's been waiting for this for a long time. And he's not taking it easy. He's jumping right back into it. And that's a good thing. Yeah, and it's it's gonna be even more uh, crazy, I guess, once he gets into his rhythm. Because we know what he can do once he's warmed up. And it's it's a terrifying thing for the NBA, to be completely honest. Yeah. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. Um, where's the standings at? Let me get back to the NBA standings. I know a lot, a lot still hasn't completely changed for the NBA for yeah. us. A lot of stuff is setting into place as we get towards midseason. Yeah. Yeah, they're just about halfway pretty quick here. And, again, we will get into it more once the NFL season has fully ended and everything. But, you know, Phoenix and Golden State are still on top of the West. Chicago and Brooklyn are still on the top of the East. The bottom of the barrel teams are still the bottom of the barrel teams. Um, it's crazy Detroit has a few more wins than Orlando, but I think Orlando has uh, some more young talent. Yeah. And he, shouts out to Franz Wagner also. And, and, yeah, he's and been Houston, balling as a rookie. Houston started to uh, get a couple wins here and there. They're getting a little healthier, so they pulled away from those bottom two, Detroit and Orlando. But yeah, or, I mean, Orlando's had some their own injury issues. Cole yeah. Anthony was out for a while. They st- they have been without Jalen Suggs since I think early November or something yeah. like that. So they still have a lot to figure out. I think there's one team we need to talk about more than anybody. Okay. The Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, a young. Do you mean the Memphis Grizzlies or John Morant? Both. <laughs> we will lead into John Morant, starting That's with. That's true. So the Grizzlies was just to preface real quick, and then I'll let you go. Yeah. The Grizzlies have won ten in a row, and have moved up to the fourth place yeah. in the Western Conference standings. Okay, go ahead. So, I think it is. It's very rare to see a young core and a young coach 
all come together and just fit and make sense and turn into a real like a real high level team this fast. Mm-hmm. This has been like a three four year process. You you draft Ja. Was was Jaron Jackson first, or was Ja first? Ja, this is Ja's third year. Jaron Jackson was first. okay. So you you get Jaron Jackson, you get Ja. The next draft you get um Desmond Bain, who a lot of teams are regretting that they didn't take him now. Because he's turning into one of the better two guards in the league. He's one of the best but three point shooters in the league this year. You hit on every draft pick. Brandon Clark. Yeah, Brandon Clark too. Xavier Tillman even. You have a full roster of guys that your oldest might be Kyle Anderson. Yeah. And he's like getting towards thirty, but like besides that, Xavier Tillman is like twenty four, twenty three or twenty four. Kyle Anderson's twenty eight. Yeah. The rest of your roster, Jaws twenty two. Jaron Jackson's like twenty one, twenty two. Or 23. Desmond Bain, all these guys are so young, but they just fit. And even going back last year with Grayson Allen, he fit perfectly. Yep. It seems like whatever young guys they throw together, they all have a specific role to play. They all know exactly what to do. And Taylor Jenkins and that coaching staff just get the best out of all of them. Yeah. They they just they are building a, a real culture in Memphis. That's it's different from the grit and grind era. They're still very tough. But the level of talent is is at a higher level than it was back then. Yeah, that was a team full of veterans, and really tough guys. This is, it, it's hard to believe they're this good this fast. Yeah, and they're playing without like Dylan Brooks being he's been out exactly. in and out of the lineup a like, lot. They're they're depending on Zaire Williams, the kid they drafted out of Stanford a lot, and he had a season high like twenty two last night. He's getting more confident. They played, um, Conchar. A guy that barely any NBA fan knows, but he fits well for them. Yep. DeAnthony Melton is a really good backup guard for them. Tyus Jones was five of five from three against the Warriors last night. Yeah, like they they have eight or nine guys that can all come in and heat up in their specific role. Yeah, and they all do it consistently. And they, it doesn't make sense for a team so young. And I think the crazy thing is, and it's kind of sad for kind of his career, but like Jarrett Culver is on the. Bottom of their bench, exactly. And he was a guy that was a top five pick in a couple of, couple years ago that everybody thought would be some defensive nightmare, and he just hasn't found his footing. But like, just to have that option also, and like, Killian Tilly is on their team. He dunked on uh, Jalen Smith against Phoenix. Yeah, and like, he's been a reliable shooter and defender. He doesn't play a, a ton necessarily for the team, but again, it's like these young options. John yeah. Teske is on this team. I don't know if you John knew that. John Teske. Yeah. He's not in Orlando anymore? He nope. got picked up by – wow, I didn't know he got picked up by a team. I did not I know I doubt they'll play either, him. <laughs> he was but, on their yeah. roster sheet for, uh, against the Warriors. Huh, the other good night. for John. So, yeah. But, yeah, I, I believe they're, like, the youngest team in the league by far. Um, I don't think they're the youngest. Oh, wait, those, those bottom the teams. It might be the Thunder. Uh, yeah, the, the Thunder is by far the worst. I mean, the youngest and one of the worst. Because Memphis – remember, Memphis beat them, like, the biggest blowout in NBA history. Yeah. But – now we transition to that guy. A guy that's looking like he could become what Derrick Rose, Rose was supposed to be. Yeah, that's three, a good yeah, comparison, actually. Three years into Derrick Rose's career, he was MVP and had Chicago as one of the best teams in the league. Three years into John Morant's career, he has Memphis as a top four seed with a bunch of young guys just playing scrappy, tough basketball. And... In my opinion, he's debatably the best, the second best point guard in the NBA right now. You got Steph, who yeah, him, KD in the MVP race, mm-hmm. DeRozan too. But really, who else do you put as the second best point guard in the league right now? Yeah, ahead of Ja. I mean, the what he's doing to teams, the highlights he's putting up, his highlights are like complete momentum shifters, and they just take get teams out of games. That block. I was going to say the block that he had against the Lakers. It looked like something from 2K or NBA Live. Yeah. It didn't look real. Mm-hmm. Two hands at the top of the square. Like, LeBron said it, like, correctly. He has rockets in his calves. Yeah. He can just take off within an instant. Mm-hmm. And he's become such a leader of men. Like, I watched the that Grizzlies versus Warriors game last night was one of the best games I've seen of the season so far. And his chemistry he has with everybody. He hit Zaire Williams on like four alley oops. Yeah. And it's clear that they're just in sync. Every every like athletic person on the court 
knows where to be when Ja's in the paint because it's a it's potential he could just throw it up. And everybody's in position for him to catch it when he's there. It's 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 a rare thing to see. It really is. Cause I I, just, I I don't know what else what more to say. Yeah. Like they look like they have a special group. That could be this is going out on a limb. But if they keep this group together and they keep this chemistry and keep getting better, could they be like Spurs esque? Yeah, a team that's kind of doubted yeah. every year. Because but the, the, there. the way Tim, Manu, and Tony came together and they just rot- rotated good pieces every year. And because of good coaching, everybody just fit every season. Yeah. They're, this is a team in their early 20s and they just comp- like continually fit each year. They, sw- they swap only like two or three players, but it always makes sense for some reason. And we haven't even brought up Steven Adams, who was surprisingly, insanely, only like 26 years old. Yeah. He's been a seamless fit at center for them. After Jonas Valanciunas fit well for them last year, mm-hmm. they, just, they just keep figuring it out and getting the best out of their guys every year. Yeah. And none of them are in their prime. <laughs> none of them. Like, it's, it's scary. Yeah, I, it's I agree. It's really scary. I think they're going to be a fun team uh, to keep an eye on for a while now, um, like you said, because they're they're so young and they, like you said again, that they have so much chemistry already and they're getting a lot out of these guys that nobody really knew, like the Desmond Baines and the DeAnthony Melton, exactly that people were unsure about necessarily um, coming into the NBA. So yeah. I, I agree. That's a, a good, fun team to watch. Other than that, not much else. I just I could I can just say I love watching the Bulls. I love the way they play. DeRozan and Zach Levine, how unselfish they are together, like sharing the Alpha Dog title is great. Yeah. And like last night during the Pistons game, the Bulls fans were chanting MVP whenever DeRozan was like on a run. Mm-hmm. And you can tell Zach Levine is just fine with it. Yeah. Like, he's still going to do his thing. Lonzo is going to do his part. Everybody, it's, it's, yeah, they're they're just really good. And getting this much out of Io DeSumo this early ha- helps them a ton, too. Yeah. It's like he stepped right out of Illinois and he's playing the exact same way. Mm-hmm. Have we talked about Kyrie being back? Uh, probably not. I mean, we might have mentioned it last week. Um, he's, yeah. only, he's only played one game, I think, but. Yeah, they're about to go on a run of road games where he's going to get back into, yeah, a groove. Uh, he had 22 against Portland, um, making up for the December 23rd game. That was on Monday. Okay. Um, he had 22 in that one. That was without Harden. And then was his debut against the Bucks? It was against uh, Indiana, the Pacers, because that that was the game where Lance Stevenson. <laughs> Yeah, had twenty points in the first quarter and had thirty. He's he's just meant to be a pacer apparently because whenever he gets with that team, he just flashes. Yeah, so Kyrie's had twenty two in both of his his games so far. So I mean, he's kind of back to just being himself, I guess. Yeah, but only on away games. Yeah, before we end, Boston, New York, and Atlanta still trying to figure out how to get back to what they were. It's really concerning with Boston because. M.A. Udoka is calling out his players, and it seems like there's no leader. Yeah. It's, it's really, really concerning. Mm-hmm. The Cleveland Cavaliers. They're still they're still there. It seems like they are going to like maintain this unless there are more injuries. Yeah. The getting Ricky Rubio getting hurt really sucked, but Darius Garland is doing his thing. Evan Mobley is looking like he's going to be a beast for a while. Even Kevin Love has his flashes of looking like his old self. Yeah. Yeah, the Cavs are interesting to watch. Again, we'll, we're slowly digging more into the NBA as it goes on, but there just there hasn't been that much stuff going on. We Russell are, Westbrook sucks. Wow. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, we are also heading towards the trade deadline somewhat soon. Yeah. Uh, so that should be, be a good amount of teams making moves. Yeah, that should be good for us, um, and especially the Pistons. So yeah. All right, here we go. This is what I'm most excited for. This weekend, we got NFL playoffs begin, and mm-hmm. I have no idea who's going to win these games, to be well, honest. You, I think you you know a few. I mean – Pittsburgh beating Kansas City, the odds of that are 
Well, Ben Very. Roethlisberger came out today and he said he knows that they're the long shot favorite, so let's just have fun yeah. out there. That's what he's, which means there are picks coming. With the, what, that's what that means. Could be. Yeah. Last time they played Kansas City, it was a, uh, a beatdown. Yeah. All right. So let's start from the top. On Saturday, we got a couple of games. Raiders at the Bengals to start off. I think this is this could be the most one of the most exciting games of the first round. The Raiders kind of just sneaking in, um, beating the Chargers last Sunday night, uh, which I guess we didn't even talk about that whole scenario. But the Chargers potentially uh, potentially ruined their chances at making the playoffs by Brandon Staley calling a timeout at the end of the game. They could have just taken a knee and tied and made where, the playoffs. Yeah, apparently the Raiders were ready to take a knee to tie the game and let both teams make it into the yeah. playoffs, which would have been insane. Um, and I'm sure a lot of teams are sighing uh, that they don't have to play against Justin Herbert in the playoffs. Who, let's say, put on an absolute show yeah. against the Raiders. That last drive in the fourth quarter, he made at least five throws where I was like, I don't know how he's doing this. Yeah, His level of arm strength and accuracy is next level. And a, a lot of announcers and guys pointed out that it seemed like at times – his players were dropping balls because he was throwing it too hard. Oh, he, and that they couldn't he was catch throwing it. missiles. Yeah. So he meant business. <laughs> it's insane. Um, but congrats to the Raiders. Like, the Raiders are another one of those teams where they just find ways to win it. Like. Yeah, they hit a lot of controversy with the whole John Gruden thing, and they just stayed together and figured it out. Yeah, thing after thing in the last couple of years even. Um, but, yeah, and now they're going to play the Bengals. Bengals have a lot of hype going into this game. And I think that kind of counts against them because everybody is so entranced by what Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase did at the end of the season. And I think people forget like what happens when NFL teams go to the playoffs. Defenses step up. The game slows down. There's not always as much offense. Every once in a while, we do see some, some big offensive explosions. But for the most part, games tend to slow down. And I think the way that the Raiders play Play and the way that they kind of willed themselves into this playoff, I think they have a really good chance in this game. And like both teams, as much as you think like Derek Carr likes to air it out, Joe Burrow likes to air it out, both of these teams are predicated on the run. They like to get Josh Jacobs going. They like to get Joe Mixon going for the Bengals. And then both teams have pretty solid defenses. So I don't know exactly who I think is going to win this game. I, I kind of honestly want to pick the Raiders because I think the Bengals might have too much hype going into this game. But I'm excited for this one. I agree with pretty much everything you said. I think the Bengals, they deserve the hype they're getting mm -hmm. because they have phenoms on offense and a, and a defense that people didn't expect to be as good as they are. But I think there's a difference between these two teams. The Bengals, I think they're going to play with confidence and some cockiness. I think the Raiders are going to play with some desperation. Derek Carr has been waiting for this moment. Mm -hmm. Honestly, ever since he tore his ACL in 2016, when he was on his way to almost being an MVP, yeah. Derek Carr has been waiting for this, a moment to show what the Raiders can be and what he is. There are times where John Gruden questioned whether or not he should be the quarterback, and Derek Carr went out there and just proved it each time that he should be out there. I've been a supporter of him for a while even those sketchy years after he got hurt. But I I knew being a, being the Raiders quarterback at that time and coming off an injury made it tough. Mm -hmm. He's shown this year, even with the 14 picks, high completion percentage, over 4,000 yards passing, and over 20 passing touchdowns. He's the leader of the team, and he got them here. I think they're going to play like there's no tomorrow, and they're going to do everything they can to pull this game out. And I think the Raiders are going to win it. Okay. I don't think it's the Bengals' time yet. Yeah. They could win, but I don't think it's their time I think that's also yet. what I'm nervous about is that, you know, it, it just might be a year too early. They need the experience under their yeah. belt first um, to really play in the playoff atmosphere. And they're going to be at home, too, which I think, I mean, it will help them. Um, but it could also hurt them, too, where, like, if you're playing bad at home, you might mentally feel even worse. Or something, or if the Raiders get off to an early lead, uh, something like that. Um, and the other thing, like Darren Waller 
is should be pretty fully healthy. I know they they kind of had to play him last week just because it's basically a pre playoff game um, to get in. So hopefully he'll be have another week to be healthy and uh, yeah, that's just another weapon for Derek Carr to have. Yeah, I think the Raiders are going to send a lot of pressure at Joe Burrow mm-hmm. because even though the O line isn't terrible like it was last year, they're still pretty average to below average. Right. So if you get some pressure on Burrow, he can move, he can escape and make magic. But eventually, mistakes can happen, especially yeah. on a second year quarterback with a bunch of young ta- uh, skill talent around him. Yeah. And then the nightcap on Saturday is the Patriots and the Bills. Very familiar with each other. This is a divisional matchup. They already played twice. They split in season. Um, When the Patriots won, it was really poor weather. That was when Mac Jones only threw the ball three times. Um, And now they're going to be at Buffalo. I'm sure the weather is going to be terrible. Uh, But I think this is the same scenario. I think this is just a little too early for the Patriots. I know that Belichick's going to get them in the right order. He's going to have them ready to play. But at the same time, it, it's going to come down to Mac Jones and these guys to make plays when they need it. Yeah. Josh Allen's been here before. He's done it before. He's had these big games. I, I think the Bills are just the more veteran team at this point, and I think the Bills are going to win this game. I still think it could be close because of the weather, um, but I think we're going to see what we saw early on with the Bills. I know they kind of stumbled uh, midway through the season, but I think uh, – I think they're going to take care of the Patriots uh, actually pretty handily in this game. Yeah, so they played uh, on November, no, December 6th. Yeah, not too long. And the weather in that game was ridiculous too. Three passing attempts from Mac Jones, 30 from Josh Allen, Mm -hmm. which ended up biting them in the end. Yep. I think Buffalo is more wise in this game. I don't think they make Josh Allen throw it 30 to 35 times if it's bad weather. They know what game plan New England is going to stick to. Run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. Possibly a few trick plays. They like to have their receivers throw the ball. And I think Buffalo gets the win. I don't think it's going to be high scoring. I think it could be something like 20 to like 13. But, yeah, I think Buffalo is prepared for the Patriots this time with weather being bad. Yeah. Last time they tried to force the issue and it didn't go their way. Well, and the previous time on December 26th, they also played each other. Um, and that's where yeah, Bills Buffalo kind of take took care of business. I mean, yep. Damian Harris had a good game in that one. But Mac Jones threw two interceptions. He was 14 of 32. Yeah, Josh because, Allen had a great game. Yeah, because that was a time where Mac Jones had to make some plays. And he just couldn't get it done. I think that's kind of might be the similar scenario in this one. Uh, so, yeah, I, I also had the Bills. Then on Sunday, we get a lineup of games of we get the Eagles playing the Buccaneers at home. I'm on, I'm I'm excited to see this game. I am Jalen Hurts and that a team nobody expected to be here. Yeah, just in this situation randomly. Yeah, it almost seems like they still shouldn't be in the playoffs. Yeah, so. and we know how I feel about the Eagles. They always they, I they want always, them to win. I'm a fan of the Eagles. They I always I like, get you. I like this team, but they always yeah they somehow figure out a way to ruin it. Which they can't ruin it in the playoffs because I don't expect them to win. And if they won, I'd be super excited. That'd be kind of cool. Um, but I'm just excited in general to see what Jalen Hurts can do. And Miles Sanders should be back for this one. And although the Buccaneers are one of the better known defenses against the run, they have given up a good amount of rushing this year. So they're not as strong. They're just getting some defensive players back from injury for this game. So there is like an outside chance that the Eagles could make it interesting. But obviously at the end of the day, it's Tom Brady, it's Rob Gronkowski, it's Mike Evans. Even with the injuries they have. Yeah. Tom Brady should make pretty. Right. I mean, Leonard Leonard Fournette will be back for this game as well. It could be kind of close in the first half, but Tom Brady, it shouldn't be very hard for him to Get this team out of here. Right. I, I think this is a good kind of just experience game for the Eagles. I'm excited to see what they can do <clears throat> and see if they can at least slow down the Bucks. Because you got to think, like, their secondary is actually really good. Darius Slay is a shutdown corner. Um, so if he can shut down Mike Evans a little bit, again, maybe they make it interesting. But at the end of the day, yes, I think the Bucks are going to win this game. I agree. 
All right. The Sunday game that I'm most intrigued about, 49ers and Cowboys. Cowboys are at home. Cowboys at one point and and some games have looked like one of the best teams in the league. But there's something about the 49ers. They just beat the Rams at the end of the season, um, securing their spot in the playoffs. Debo Samuel, what he has done this season for this team is just incredible. How many other wide receivers have been high-level running backs as well? And, and a quarterback in the last team? <laughs> How many guys uh, are as, yeah, as talented as him? Right. I, I don't know. And, you know, we knew that Debo Samuel was talented coming out of college. But to see what he's done this year has been a big surprise. Um, he's had, like, multiple, like, 70-yard plays, like, just big playability. Yeah. He, he doesn't even have to run, like, any insane routes. Just give him the ball in space. Right. And he can break it at any point. And the scary part is that's exactly what the 49ers want because, again, they're another team that likes to establish the run. And they have they have a pretty good running game, but they can also make that big play when they need to. So that's the scary part about this team. I think the 49ers are one of those teams that can beat just about anybody. And the reason I'm most excited about this, te- this game is because I think there's a chance the 49ers will win. Because we've seen the Cowboys be so dominant, but also at the same time, like they've struggled at times. Like Zeke hasn't been himself necessarily. There's been times where Dak looked not very good. Now the good thing for Dak is that his last couple games to end the season have been really strong. Uh, so there's hope there. But I don't know. There's something weird about the Cowboys, and their defense is super good this season. It's always something. Yeah, it is always something. But I feel like they could do the Cowboys thing again and lose this game. I think I'm going to pick the 49ers, one, because it would be more fun for me. It would be incredible. <laughs> but I think that there's like a, a real possibility that that could happen. Um, because the way the 49ers like to play, they slow the game down and they make it tough. Their defense is good. They got one of the best tight ends in the game. Jimmy Garoppolo came back. He looked all right after his finger issue. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm going to pick the 49ers in this one and uh, hope for the best. Yeah, if if the Cowboys don't come out strong in this one, I will have serious doubts of them winning the game because there's they still ever since Dak has been there, they do this thing where only like four or five times a year they come out strong. Most games they come out flat and in the second half Dak just has to put up a bunch of numbers. If th- if that happens this game, I think the 49er defense like what they showed last year, last week against the Rams, they can they are gonna get stops when they need to, and on offense they can make plays when they need to. Yeah, Dak has to be on top of his game. The Cowboys have to be on top of their game in a, in the playoffs. They've rarely done it over the past twenty years. They like you said they've shown inconsistencies in the past four or five weeks. What Cowboys team shows up in this in, in this game? Yeah, we're not sure. And then the Sunday night, the most boring game of this playoff series. <laughs> uh, the Chiefs playing the Steelers, which this could have been the Chiefs and the Chargers in the first round of the playoffs, which would have been insane. Patrick Mahomes yeah. has never been in the first round of the playoffs in his career. Um, but now he's going to play Ben Roethlisberger and the Steelers. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I guess, like, T.J. Watt's exciting. He's been exciting, but... Even though the Chiefs have struggled this year, they're still 12-5. and five. They're the number two seed in the AFC. They're, they're going to figure it out. I think this game should be easy for them. The Steelers, they kind of limped into the playoffs. They got some help from the Raiders. So, yeah. I, I just yeah. don't see this game being all that competitive unless Najee Harris does something. I think that's what it's going to depend on is that Najee Harris runs, runs really well and the Pittsburgh defense figures out a way to stop Patrick Mahomes and all these weapons. At no point this season have the Steelers looked like a very good team. Every win they get, they squeak out. Yeah. A lot of their losses are close too because they have talent, good enough talent. But yeah, I just don't. The odds of Ben Roethlisberger having the best game of the season now after they get stomped at Kansas City Mm -hmm. and the odds of Kansas City coming out slow and never getting like any uh, what are the odds right it it just it just doesn't seem likely 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I still think it would be kind of cool and kind of funny, I guess, if the Steelers figured it out, but I, I can't see it happening. At I least. would hate it. So I need this Big Ben era to end. <laughs> I need it to end. Just cut it, please. Yeah. All right. And then on Monday night, we got another divisional matchup as the first round of the playoffs. The Cardinals are playing the Rams once again. These teams are very familiar with each other. Yep. And uh, similar to the Bills and uh, Patriots, they split during the season. And both teams are really weird. Both teams have looked super good at, at times. And then they've had these games where you're like, what the heck? How did the Lions beat you? Speaking about the Cardinals. Yeah. Matthew Stafford has thrown the most pick sixes in the league this season. I don't know. They about ramped it. up as the season went on. Good old Matthew Stafford. Yeah, but they still finished twelve and five on the year. Um, I don't know. It's it's going to be interesting. Like, it's a, it's again, what team is going to show up here for the Cardinals and for the Rams? Are is Kyler going to figure something out? Because he hasn't looked all that great um, these last couple weeks. And the problem is this is becoming a trend for the Cardinals where in the second half of the season, the last couple of seasons, they have struggled and not done as well as they did at the beginning. And then the Rams, I mean, Cooper Cup has looked insane this season. He's had an all-time great season, yeah. Even with the extra game, yeah, he's had an incredible season. Odell Beckham Jr. seems to be finding his footing a little bit on this team. Tyler Higby is reliable. Sony Michelle has kind of reemerged and he's been that number one guy, but they are going to get Cam Akers back for this. And he's supposed to play some snaps here and there. I don't know how much they're going to use him, but if he is any bit of healthy, like he was at the end of last season, he could be really useful for this team. And then both defenses are pretty good. Um, the Rams obviously have more star players, bigger names, but at times they, they give up points uh, like they did last week to the 49ers. And then the Cardinals' defense is pretty solid, but they also, I mean, again, they lost their, the Lions. I don't know how that works, but it will be exciting. I'm going to go with the Rams because I think this is going to be this thing with the Cardinals where for some reason they can't really figure it out, and I think Cliff Kingsbury is going to be on the chopping block. After the successful of a season? Because After, they don't because they don't make a run? Because they can't make it over okay. the hump at this point. Yeah. The last two games of the season, the Cardinals started to get back into what they were. They had a really good win at Dallas. And then Russell Wilson barely beat them at home. I don't know why. I, I don't know if I can trust Matt Stafford. In That's this. fair. The pick sixes have just been ramping up. And they've still been able to pull out wins because they're overall really good. But Cardinals beat them once. Rams beat them once. I think I might trust Kyler Murray more than Matt Stafford. Okay. Even I trust though, him to not make crazy decisions Yeah. The in last, the most important times. The last time they played on December 13th, it was 30-23. to 23. Yeah. Rams won. Then <laughs> the Cardinals lost to the Lions, 30-12. to 12. Then they lost to the Colts, 22-16. to 16. Then they beat Dallas by three, and then they lost their final season of game of the season, thirty-eight to thirty, to the Seahawks. That is just such a mess for me. I cannot, I can't believe in them. Even though Matthew Stafford hasn't looked great, so yeah, the Ram, I, I I understand people favoring the Rams, but I don't know. To me, it's more of a toss-up. Yeah, I agree. That's the NFL playoffs. I'm excited for these games. I'm going to watch a lot of them. Yeah, and. We still have to wait another week to see Green Bay and those Tennessee Titans secure the number one spot in the AFC. Crazy. The return enough. of Derrick Henry. So we'll get to see. We'll recap some of those games um, next week and talk about the next round, the divisional round. Um, get more into the NBA and college basketball, hopefully. We won't have too many more postponements. Um, and we'll get to see how these teams are doing. And we'll be updated. But until next time, this has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys later. I'm so happy they cleaned house in in New York for the Giants. That that press conference, Joe Judge just talked his way out of a job. Just making fun of other organizations. Just absolutely nonsense. Hire Brian Flores, some team, please. <laughs>